So some of the neat things about frescoes from Pompeii is that you can really study them in depth and you could study the different phases. And they, there's a variety of subject matter and, um, and style in Pompeii. And because it's so well preserved, you can really track it down. And the variety that we have <clears throat> often moves from a, a architectural trompe l'oeil kind of design, sometimes with a deep space and a background, to an awful lot of wall painting that depicts things like still life and also myth mythological stories and even some battles and wars uh, that are being depicted. And we also see the same thing somewhat in mosaic. Probably the most famous one, at least in the art history books, often is this still life from the House of the Stags. And it's not actually from Pompeii, it's from the, a town that's very nearby called Herculaneum. And basically, what it depicts is a still life painting that shows some peaches and a glass of water. And if you really think about it, at a time when fresh fruit wasn't around all year and, and uh, sometimes even water could be scarce and clear water would be scarce. F paintings of things like this would almost be a, a sort of fetishistic way. I think sometimes what you could think about, sometimes the subject matter of paintings for any culture is often something that you want to have but you don't necessarily have at that moment. And uh, I suppose uh, teenagers could relate to this in some ways, for instance, of sports icons or pinups, uh, sometimes cars are a, fi are a favorite subject. And it's almost like a fetishistic way of possessing that, at least you own it in an image. Now, one of the ways of looking at this painting is there's, it's not that illusionistic, but it's an attempt to be illusionistic. It's not like today's still life painting because they didn't really develop things to that level yet. But it is really the height of virtual reality and the height of illusionism for the Pompeians and for the Romans that this kind of wall painting. And one of the things that's really tough to paint often is, for instance, a glass of water. And this is done fairly convincingly in this. However, some of the drawing is a little bit off. They don't really have some of the, the, the traditional skills that we have, for instance, since the Renaissance, where, for instance, the cast shadow underneath the water is a little awkward. It's a little weird, but there are some reflections of light on it. Also, some of the other things that we see here, um, there's no real passage of light and shadow over it, but they, the fruit do lay down some cast shadow. There's also no perspective on the surfaces that these things are on. So it's an early attempt by a fairly nice naive artist to create a sort of trompe l'oeil or a painting that can fool the eye that's supposed to be true and realistic. And it isn't until much later that we get there. Now, the other thing that in terms of formal stuff that I want to point out to you is that this painting really also depicts um, some levels of how fresco is painted. Mm. So for instance, if you look at the way that this fresco is painted, the glass of water this little vessel of water, it looks like, I think it's fresco secco, S-E-C-C-O, because it's white lines on the, on the plaster. And ordinarily what you would do is you would leave the plaster bare if you wanted some light areas. And so in this instance, they probably went in either with encaustic, probably not encaustic, probably um, with, with um, some kind of uh, tempera paint on top of the surface. And you can see the nicks and the scars in the fresco as well show some of the undercoating of the plaster. Two of the frescoes that I think really relate to some of the things that we've talked about in terms of uh, Greek and Roman mythology and specifically relate to the Baki are these two frescoes that are from Pompeii. On the left-hand side, what we see is an image of Europa and the bull. And you know how Zeus is always coming down at, in disguise and carrying the ladies off. This is another one of those scenes. And we have the bull in the foreground. And notice that the bull is kind of foreshortened. And there's actually, uh, it seems to me that they're, that they're lightening things in the background. So they're actually doing what's called a little bit of atmospheric perspective, where the things in the background become lighter and it's a way of showing space. And you see Europa, her body is based somewhat on some of the sculptures that we've seen. We see the traditional clothing and there's a little bit of wet drapery on her. And Europa is this young, beautiful woman who I believe was the daughter of King Cadmus. No, not the daughter. I'm sorry. The sister of King Cadmus. And this is well in advance of the, the events in the play, the Baki. And Zeus comes along as a bull and carries off 
Europa, this young, beautiful princess. And uh, Cadmus's dad says, go find your sister and don't come home until you do. And he doesn't. He can't find her because, of course, Zeus has carried her away. And um, where Cadmus ends up, he ends up founding the city of Thebes, which is kind of an interesting story in itself, and you might want to look that up. In the right-hand image, we have an image of a satyr. And a satyr is a half-man, half-ghost, half-goat creature, and he is also considered one of the followers of Dionysus, and he is also an aide to Dionysus. In this instance, we don't really see him having goat legs, but instead we do see he has some horns, and he's very dark-skinned because he hangs out in the forest all the time. And you have these women who are the Maenids, or Minids, who are, who are surrounding him. And so this is a depiction of probably the whole idea of the goat dance, and you see at the satyr's feet is a goat. Fresco also has this wonderful way of being kind of like pottery and, and it's kind of a disposable art. So it, it lets us know what the values of the culture were. So in this instance, we've got the three graces. And sometimes the three graces can be confused with the three fates, but the three graces for, for the Romans and the Greeks are kind of important allegorical figures. They represent wisdom, beauty, um, intellect, uh, and um, rationality. And uh, so depending on who you look up, they tend to combine these things. But I also think that this is sort of a disguise or a cover or a beard for wanting to look at the naked ladies again. And they're standing in contrapposto, and they're supposed to be the three graces, but it's also, even though it's a heady theme and it's supposed to be intellectual, it's a cover in some ways for our desire to fetishistically look at something that we might not have access to at that moment. And in this instance, it's the naked female form. Frescoes also specifically can communicate ideology and can communicate um, historical myth in some ways. And so what we see here is this game of telephone. And remember when we started out on um, the, the island of Crete and the city of Knossos, also called Knossos, we talked about Theseus, this legendary Athenian king who ends up slaying the Minotaur in the maze. Well, we see here in the left-hand side of the image, the Minotaur is just outside of the maze, and Theseus here has obviously slain him. And the Athenian kids who have, um, who have been rescued by him, these aristocratic youth, they're standing there kissing his feet, hugging his feet, kissing his hand, and kind of, uh, you know, Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. We're not worthy kind of thing. And we see Theseus standing in all of his glory, standing an awful lot like the sculpture, the Doryphorus that we looked at. And so we have this sculpture standing, or this figure of a hero, a young male figure, who is standing in contrapposto. The anatomy is fairly accurate, and we get a sense that they're actually studying anatomy to some extent. They're really looking at this. And then the flat, um, two-dimensional uh, visual tradition that they're trying to kind of follow up in the Verus tradition that we saw in sculpture. The other thing that you're kind of seeing here is that there's a little bit of size-scale relationship, and they're trying to create the sense of space with the foreground, middle ground, and background of the figures on the right-hand side. You actually see them overlapping in a fairly rationalistic way, and the architecture is tending to make some sense. You have a little bit of light and shadow moving across the figures, and so this is really what I think that in the Renaissance they thought would be the ultimate goal of the Romans, and the Renaissance in some ways in Italy at this at in the um, 13 to 1400s picks up where this kind of painting left off and they bring it to the next level. I just threw this one in because it's funny and kind of fun and shows some of the uh, ideas that that this is also a playful culture and <clears throat> we all know what a hermaphrodite is uh, part female part male and we've got this uh, young satyr who does have goat legs in this instance who's probably pan and uh, pan was uh literally horny he had horns on his head but was always chasing the the nymphs and uh he mistakes this uh the goddess or god hermaphrodite um for someone that he can have access to and he runs over and he and she he reveals herself and um he's freaked out by it and runs off and this is just kind of a um, a funny scene from Roman painting. So we're going to go outside of the city and we're going to visit a place called the Villa of the Mysteries. And we're going to look at some frescoes that relate to the Villa of the Mysteries. And 
my main idea or thesis for this next section of the talk or lecture is to discuss the relationship of the Bacchic and Dionysic rites that we encountered in the play of the, um, the Bacchic women or the, the, um, the Bacchi to um, Roman culture. And so we're going to go outside of the city to this place called the Villa of the Mysteries and we're going to look at some of the frescoes and some intermediary fresco frescoes between. There are lots of references to Dionysian or Bacchic cults in Pompeii and Herculaneum. And this wall painting in particular shows the um, Thyrsus and uh, the fawn skin and the drinking vessels. And remember I told you when we were looking at the vessel by Ezekiel about how Dionysus makes the ships have a bunch of um, vines, grape vines grow out of the deck and then there are panthers and snakes associated with him. Well, all of the objects that we see in this fresco are associated with Dionysian rites. You beat those symbols which are just basically a, a, a clanging sort of castanet made out of metal and then you would wear the fawn skin and then we have the leopard and the snake in the bottom. The other thing about this fresco is from a formal point of view, look at how wonderful the um, the foreshortening on the pots are and the ellipses in the top of some of the pottery and that they almost have a sense of linear perspective that they don't develop until the Renaissance later on in the 1400s. This artist is intuitively getting a lot of the visual stuff correct. This is one of those other frescoes that depicts um, Dionysus and one of his maenads, one of the Bacchic women following behind him. And we see he's got grape leaves around his head and he's holding a wine cup. And so what I'm kind of saying in some ways, this is kind of like Miami during spring break or something like that. It's, uh, it's definitely meant to be the good life. It's meant to be enjoying, drinking, partying, having a good time. You're in the thrall of the god Dionysus or Bacchus, who is the god of ecstasy. Also, some of the things about the story about Dionysus, besides being an ecstatic god, is that he is also a god in some ways of rebirth and regeneration. The reason why I bring up the fact that Dionysus is both the god of ecstasy and uh, wine and drama, and he also represents uh, ecstasos and rebirth, is that we see these references all throughout Pompeii, that it's kind of, we've got this dancing maenad and this satyr here done in a sort of mosaic of marble called intarsia. But a place called the Villa of Mysteries really lays out some of this. Now, <clears throat> what I'm going to lay down for you here is probably more theoretical. There's no strong factual evidence to back this up. I have found some sources that seem to uh, corroborate what I'm saying, and one of the sources is a guy named Joseph Campbell who talks about archetypes. <clears throat> At the Villa of the Mysteries, there's a series of frescoes that are life-size figures that run around the exterior of the wall inside one of the rooms. It's actually uh, not an enormous room, but it actually has mosaic on the floor and these red frescoes on the walls. And they show a series of bizarre kinds of rites and events, and it looks almost like a rave today or an S&M party. It's just kind of a bizarre scene. We see in some of the corners things that we're not really sure, women running, and then in the right-hand side what we're looking at is this weird older guy who's holding up a bowl and some other guy who's holding a mask behind his head. And if you look at this scene that's going on, the way that Joseph Campbell describes what it is, he thinks that it is an initiation scene. And what he bases this on is the idea of that there were these things called Bacchic rites in which if you got initiated into the <clears throat> cult of the god uh, Bacchus, it might mean that you could be reborn in some kind of ecstatic state. And what this is based on is somewhat in the mythology concerning um, Bacchus or Dionysus. Is at several points he's, uh, he's torn apart and he is reborn once in the thigh of Zeus, the other time Zeus eats up the parts and then regurgitates him out whole again. He's often pursued. Uh, we also have the story about him uh, sort of um, coming back from the dead and coming back and inventing wine and then ending up in Thebes and, and exacting his revenge. So this might be a scene in which it's a drinking cult <laughs> in a way. And we have this older guy who's holding a wine bowl that has been polished. And um, according to Joseph Campbell, that's uh, like a silver ball, uh, bowl. And the guy who's looking into it is actually seeing a reflection of this mask 
that this other character behind him is holding up and he's actually seeing it reflected in the bowl and because he's so trashed he probably is being initiated into these rites that have to do with with uh with basically drinking or drugs and some kind of ecstatic frenzy including dance and we see on the right hand side a, a figure that to me suspiciously looks a little bit like Dionysus kind of um hanging out with some kind of uh woman who and having a good time we also see a couple of other scenes with, for instance, Nike figures and dancing scenes. And um, one of the scenes that is continuing on after we get from the bowl and the, the character holding it up and being initiated is this figure is sort of lying down and another figure who is um, a, a Nike figure. And then you move around the corner of the room and you see another figure laying down. And according to some sources, this figure who is sort of uh, laying down has either um, either she's fallen or she is literally being whipped into some kind of uh, um, frenzy and that the nexus of the pain and the pleasure is almost like getting pierced where you get or you bang your thumb really hard with a hammer. You go into this sort of state where all of a sudden you feel kind of high from it. And I think that that's kind of what's being depicted. And what sort of supports this is the man on the right hand side who's holding up those symbols we looked at uh, initially and dancing in a Bacchic frenzy.